So, again, welcome to the Berean Bible Fellowship. Today is June 2nd, 2019. The, uh, the uh, title of today's sermon are the three phases of judgment. Now, when we talk about judgment, it's kind of like you know, when, when you're dealing with your parents, uh, your parents sometimes have to sit in judgment over you. But if you make a mistake or something like that, then, you know, they, 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 they sit in judgment and they may issue punishment, okay? Like sometimes when you're, when you're told, like yesterday, we, uh, we went out on a father-son granddad day, and okay, if, if, if the kids were acting up a little bit, we would tell them, cut it out. And then if we continued, and they continue to act up, then you got a little bit louder and you you might yell and say, cut it out and scream very loud to get their attention. That was moving from the first phase of judgment to the second phase of judgment. Benadryl? Benadryl? Yeah, Benadryl. I don't have any. I, 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 I got some. I got some? Okay. Okay, so, uh, did you eat peanuts? Well, he's allergic to ibuprofen. Oh, okay. He took a leave, and then uh, that's ibuprofen. Okay. All right, Michael, get you some better. All right, so that was moving from the first phase of judgment, saying "cut it out," to the second phase of judgment, saying "cut it out," getting louder, getting your attention. And then, what do you think the third phase of judgment with parents might be? What do you think, Junior? Punishment. Punishment. What kind of punishment? Okay, what do you think? Taking away things. Tony, what do you think? Okay, taking away things. Chris? The belt. The belt. <laughs> Bear the rod, spoil the child. <laughs> so, just as we have different phases of judgment or different phases of interacting with our children or, or employees, whatever, God also had three, He has three phases, phases of judgment. Uh, in dealing with man. You know, now, my father was a, a brilliant man. And I remember him teaching a class back in the early 1970s uh, comparing the United States to the fall of Rome. And he was talking about some of the things that the Roman Empire was doing. Uh, they had a Senate and homosexuality started to creep into the Senate and pedophilia and a couple other things. And it led to their downfall. And back in the 1970s, my father actually taught a class looking at the way some of the things were going in the United States and saying that we were following right along on the same path of Rome and that the United States also would fall. Uh, I wish he was alive today to see how correct he, he was. But, you know, the United States seems to be following right on the same path as Rome in the society. And we're having things that are coming into our society that are spoiling uh, the way that we do things. Now, in the United States, we used to walk along uh, a path of righteousness, but we've turned to a path of sin and unrighteousness. Questions are, what role does God have in this decline? Is God responsible, and is He judging us for our sinful choices? Are we like Israel who also turned their back on God's ways and suffered God's stepping or backing away from them? You remember back in the book of Job, Job 1.10, Satan raises up the point that God put a hedge of protection around Job and prospered him. Do we know what a hedge of protection is? If you, if you have your, what do you think it is? Okay, but what, what, what is the hedge of protection? What do you think? Okay, that's okay. A uh, hedge of protection, think of it like you have your yard. Okay? In some yards, they have, they have a fence. And the fence keeps people from coming in unwanted, and it keeps kids from going out. So it offers a certain degree of protection. And a hedge of protection is almost like... Uh, Shrubbery. Think of it as like shrubbery, just like a fence, but it, it goes around your property to keep that property safe. 
And Satan, uh, God had, was having a conversation with Satan. Every day Satan would come to the throne of God and he would, and he, the, all the angels would come and Satan would come with them. And God asked Satan, he says, have you considered my, my servant Job? So what God was doing, God was putting Job up as an example saying, he is a righteous man. He, he does what he's told. He's, he's a good man. And Satan questioned God, and in verse 110 he says, Hast not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. So Satan was like, yes, you're putting, you're putting Job up as an example, but look, you put this hedge of protection around him. You're not, you're not letting you know, life, life's uh, hardships reach him. You're just, you know, you're protecting him. So God, what God did, God took that hedge away so that Satan could test Job and see how, see how Job fared under being tested. So in today's sermon, we will examine the case that God has placed a hedge around the United States of America. And is or has that hedge been removed? And are we in line for the three phases of judgment? Now, the United States is a unique country. It is a melting pot of many different cultures and diverse ideals, all coming together in the search, in the search of liberty and freedom. The very creation of this nation comes from those who sought the freedom to worship God as they saw fit. Different from the, or different from the Catholic Church. You remember the pilgrims that came here, they were escaping the Catholic Church in the way that they were doing things. Uh, so we always, we have always been a nation that sought the blessing of God and sought to acknowledge and to worship the one true God. In this truth, God has prospered this nation. The United States is, is, is looked at by all countries around the world as the place to be. I mean, look at our southern border. What do we got? We got millions of people coming into this country wanting to come in here legally and illegally uh, to get here in the United States, because what is what is the United States known as around the world? What do you think? What is it known as, Junior? America. It's known as America, yep. <laughs> but it's known as the land of opportunity. Everybody around the world says the United States is the land of opportunity. That's where you can go and you can work hard and, and you can prosper. You can you can do well. So through two world wars and many conflicts, God has set a hedge of protection around this nation. <clears throat> and we have responded by a large number of our citizens, citizens worshiping God freely. The United States has always been considered a Christian nation where, where the gospel has been preached and, and, and reached out to people and God, you know, people have had freedom of religion here where they could worship as they saw fit. So God has had a hedge of protection around us. God, has wor God was worshipped openly in the public square. He was acknowledged in the culture, in our daily lives, and in our government. In Romans 1.16, Paul describes the national attitude that we should have in, when we seek God's blessing. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Amen. for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we in the United States understood that the only way, by only following the righteous path that was set before us, that we would prosper as a nation. Uh, we were not ashamed to profess God's name. And we openly displayed artifacts that Yahweh is our God. You know, examples, displays of the Ten Commandments in, in the courthouses, displays of babies in the mangers, and we look upon the dollar bill, and they express our national faith. What does it say on the dollar bill? In God we trust. Amen. Amen? So, might not have been a lot of right division, but, you know, we, we, this country had uh, a national uh, consciousness of God. And, you know, when you, when you acknowledge the Almighty, He'll give you more information. Of course, you Okay, but you, you, you got to get to that step first where you acknowledge him and, and, and recognize that he is. So in Romans 17, it says, 
For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So, so what happened? We were, where did we as a nation turn off the path of righteousness? Off the plan, path of the plan of God. Back in the 1960s, atheists, cha atheists challenged the teaching of God in schools. You know, they, they actually used to have religious instruction in schools. Mm -hmm. Question. Yes. What is an atheist? I know. Yeah, that's a good question. Sure, what, what is an atheist? Someone that doesn't believe in God. Oh, very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. They're not very good, but that's a very good answer. Yes, very good. You got, you got the answer. You knew that. <laughs> so, so we, we started to allow the enemies of God to dictate what we see in public. So they took God out of the schools, and as they took God out of the schools, and they were successful in doing that, they started taking God out of all areas of our lives. They took the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse, which our, our laws in the United States are built off that foundation. Mm -hmm. But they started removing all different... Hold on a second, please forgive me. Uh, oh, good Lord. Uh, give me a second, please. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, this, hey, this is work. I'm on. Yeah, pause it for a second. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So God responds to unrighteousness with wrath. Now, how does God's wrath, uh, how does it manifest itself? How, is, how do we recognize God's wrath? What is wrath? R what, r wrath is, is, is the, the, the hand of God coming down on you. If, if yesterday, as, when, as I said, we were out at uh, Sky Zone, we had a nice day, and when, if Jermel got a little bit upset and he starts yelling, that would be like the wrath of Jamel, mm -hmm. right? Wrath can be yelling, it can be, it can be punishment, it can be misfortune, it can be illness. The wrath of God can come down in many different forms. Pestilence, diseases, famines, and crops not growing well, bad weather, like down in Oklahoma right now where Junior just came from. What do they have going on down there? What's going on down in the Midwest? You got tornadoes. And yeah. You got tornadoes and floods and things like that going on. Now sometimes those things are just natural uh, things that happen, but sometimes God uses the weather as wrath, as, as punishment, or, or ways of, of what, what does punishment do? Let me, let me let me step away. But what does what does Xavier, What does punishment do? Uh, what do you think? The, what do you think the purpose of punishment is? What do you think? Yeah. Disciplines you. Disciplines you. Very good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But what it disciplines you? But what does it teach you to do? Makes it teaches you a lesson. Makes you sit down. Makes you do what you're supposed to do, right? It's to bring you back in line. So God uses his wrath against unrighteousness to bring us into the path of righteousness. Right. Of righteousness. So he's trying to bring us around to where we need to be. God doesn't, God doesn't put his wrath down upon us because he's angry at us or he's mean. No, he's trying to bring us back in line where we're supposed to be. If, if you're in school and you're talking and your teacher doesn't try to bring you back into line, what's going to happen? You're not going to get the information. You're not going to learn. You're going to get other kids in trouble. Other things are going to happen. So the teacher will talk to you at first and try to bring you back into line. Okay, And that's what God does. He tries to bring us back into line. Now, we've been, we've been practicing ungodliness and unrighteousness for many, many years, okay? And it, it's been increasing, and we've, been, we've not been coming back in line. We've been going more off course. So, like we were talking in school, we got away with it the first time. Now we're doing it all the time. We don't even care if we're going to get caught, okay? We, we, we practice unrighteous now. And we now sit approximately 50 to 60 years from those decisions moving us away from God and His ways. Many children are now raised 
without God consciousness. Because we don't have the teaching of God in schools anymore. We don't have it in our public squares. There are certain children, you bring up the name of God, they, don't have, they have no clue who you're talking about. They don't know that we have a had a Savior who died on the cross to pay for our unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Because even though as good as we try to be, we still mess up sometimes, don't we? Yeah. We still do what we're not supposed to do. So we needed a Savior to come and pay for our unrighteousness. And that's what Jesus Christ did. So God has revealed himself to them also. They are without excuse, as it says in Romans 1, 19 and 20. And what does that mean, you're without excuse? That means that we came here to church, okay? And, and Junior was running around and he ran into a window and broke a window. Now, no one told Junior, don't break a window, but he should know better. He should know you're not supposed to break windows, right? So he has knowledge of what he should and shouldn't do. <laughs> Junior said, I didn't do that, what are you talking about? And in Romans 1, 19-20 it says, Because that they which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in God hid, so that they are without excuse. And what that means is, is God has revealed himself in nature. You know, we look outside and we say, how did this, how did this magnificent world get made? Okay, we, 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 are, we are fearfully and wonderfully made our own bodies. How did this all this happen? You know, science will tell you, oh, well, you know, you came from a puddle of goo in a pond. Uh, most people have the common sense and say, you know, that doesn't make sense. That, that doesn't make sense. And the other ones are, you know, you came from the monkeys. You guys may act like monkeys sometimes, but you didn't come from monkeys. <laughs> okay? So even with the testimony of nature and all of creation, man has insisted on coming up with alternatives to God's works and ways. They refuse to acknowledge Him. So what did this cause? Since we have pursued unrighteousness, our hearts have become impure. Now we seek fulfillment outside of the will of God. We seek after those things that feed our sinful natures. We are, we, now we seek the lust for money, power, and wealth. What we now admire are those things that stand in opposition to God. Look at the rap culture and what they glorify. They degrade women, they worship gun violence, and drugs and violence and drug and alcohol abuse. What we hear in music and see on TV and games glorifies the sinful flesh in us and leads us further and further away from our Creator and reconciliation with Him. You know, they say, garbage in, garbage out. So if you only put bad things in all the time, like when you're playing the video games and it's, it's showing you to kill this person and rob this person and run this one over, that's going to come out in you because that's what's going in. Garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so that's why parents are starting now to restrict kids from playing these video games and, and, and doing all these things because it's not good information coming in and it's exposing kids to things that they should not yet be exposed to. I know that they're easy babysitters. It's very easy to sit a kid down in front of a Nintendo and sit there four or five hours and he's not making any noise. He's not running around, you know, uh, knocking, on, knocking the walls down. He's, yeah. he's engaged in his game. But what's being put in cannot be fixed. Garbage in, garbage out. At a certain point, God turns you over to your wicked desires. Romans 1, uh, 121 says, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What do you think it means to have your heart darkened? Okay, you know, in in in, in uh, all things, you know, that which is light is good, that which is dark is bad, right? So to say that your heart has been darkened, what do you think it means? 
What do you think? Brush. Huh? Broke. Broke? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of... What do you think, Junior? Bad. Bad, yeah. So your heart, what, which was once sought after good, now seeks after bad. And that's what happened to men. God, God turned them over to their wicked desires because they kept going towards unrighteousness. So God said, you know what? That's what you want? Have at it. That would be like in school, you know, you're talking and making noise and being disruptive and everything like that. And your teacher says, you know what? Have at it. I've had enough. I've had enough. You don't want to learn. You don't want to learn to be good. You don't want to be smart. Have at it. Go do, go, go do you. <laughs> okay? So, so God turned man over. And he stopped trying to stand in man's way. He stopped trying to guide them to righteousness. He says, you want unrighteousness? I turn you over to it. This is the first stage of judgment, the first phase of judgment, where God turns you over to your wicked desires. Mm -hmm. And, let's see, let's, yep, and... So when God saw that their hearts were darkened, He turned them over and gave them over to it. Romans 1, 22, 23 describes what happens when the heart darkens and man, man starts to look for alternatives to the Godhead. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and became the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like, like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So man, in his own wisdom, started coming up with alternatives to God. He told, okay, we, can't, we, we, we refuse to accept the fact that God created this wonderful world and everything goes along according to a, the pattern that the Bible has set forth. We, we're going to make up our own theories on how this all happened to be. Okay, so we, we're not going to accept uh, an almighty God. Okay, so what did they say? They said, well, okay, if God didn't create the universe and everything in it, let's see, how, how did it happen? Oh, a big explosion happened out of nowhere and created all matter that will ever exist. All this happened from nothing. How many times have you seen nothing explode? How many times have you seen nothing create something? You got to have something. You know, you guys were playing with sparklers yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. Sparklers. What did you need? You have the sparkler. You have you have something there already, right? Mm -hmm. What did, what did what did you need to get that sparkler going? Anybody? A lighter. A lighter. A lighter. You needed ignition. So something had to. You you could leave that sparkler sitting there all day. If you don't light it, does it? Do the sparkles come out? Yeah. No, they don't. Uh, so they don't come out. Now, do, so do you think that there was just nothing, no space, no time, nothing, and all of a sudden, it just decided to boom and blow up? And you've seen explosions before, right? You've seen explosions on TV. Have you ever seen an explosion create something? Did you ever see something blow up and then all of a sudden, boom, there was something there? A mess. No. It... It creates chaos, doesn't create order. Okay, so an explosion doesn't put things together, it actually blows things apart. But that's what the theory they came up with. They said this big bang, it's called the big bang theory, this big bang happened. And then they and then they went from there, they said, okay, how did how did all this stuff create? How did man come into being? Uh well. I think man was created from a puddle of goo. He started in a puddle of goo, then he became a fish, and then he went from a fish to an ape, and then he went from an ape to a man. I, I, and I, I know we, we have fish, we have, we have uh, puddles of goo, and we have apes, and none of them are turning into men at present time. But you know, over millions and billions of years, see, because they had to say we had millions and billions of years, because they needed that time for this, these transformations to happen, this mutation. Okay, so they worked that one out for many years, and then they started talking about, you know what, we probably had alien ancestry. You know, because those pyramids are built so precise and so perfect, and we can't even recreate that.
that now, today, with all the technology that we have, we cannot build those uh, pyramids with the precision that they have. Okay? So they said, you know, aliens must have came from outer space from another world and, and taught man how to do this. And when they exhausted that one, then they, then they started building idols. They started building uh, different animals and putting them up as gods. So they didn't want to worship the Almighty God, but now they took birds and things like that and worshiped them. So they, they bought into the alternatives of God. So from, from lusting in the darkened heart after fleshly desires, their lust grew and their appetite for evil grew. And at a certain time, God turns them over to their lust. He removes the hedge of protection and exposes them to the dark forces of this world. And in Romans 1.24 it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now this is the second phase of judgment. How, how, do, the, how do we see the ramifications of this? Of, of God turning them over to uncleanliness and lusts of their own hearts and to dishonor their own bodies. How do we see the manifestation of this? Homosexuality is running rampant in our society. Okay? This was something, even, even with them turning their backs on God back in the 1960s, they still understood that men were men and women were women. Now we don't even understand that. Okay? They, child growing up, they said, you can be a woman if you want to. We got Caitlyn Jenner, who used to be Bruce Jenner, a world athlete, and now he's a woman. Okay? So transgenderism has become the norm. It's become the norm. And when some guy is standing there in a beard and a dress, I know that he's a guy. Okay? <laughs> Children are encouraged to question their gender. In the young ages of, of the kids, at this age, they have people telling them, well, you know, it's okay if you feel like you're a woman. It's okay for you to play with dolls. It's okay for you to practice things that girls to do instead of being a boy. Also, abortion has become a form of birth control and is worn as a badge of honor. So, God has turned us over to the lusts of our bodies and, and, and changing. Romans 1.25 says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever? So the, the, the truth of God is what? That men are men and women are women. But that is no longer acceptable and it is no longer true. If you were, I, 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 you have people saying that I'm a man born in a woman's body. Okay, so the truth of God that, that, is, that says man and woman and you need the two to, to procreate is now a lie. It's, it's, it's questioned. These were once alternative lifestyles, but now they have boldly come out of the shadows. They, the, they worship men and erect statues of Lucifer as their god. Image of, images of Baal and Dagon are now resurrected as alternatives to Yahweh. In Romans 1, 26 and 27 it says, For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Story time with the drag queen. Have you seen that one on, on, on YouTube? They have women, uh, men uh, dressed up as women and giving story time to children in schools. It's, it's, it's a growing uh, program that they have. They said that they want, to, uh, they want to make sure that children realize it's okay to have two daddies or two mommies instead of a mom and a dad. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen in San Francisco and all around the country now gay pride parades. Okay? These things are coming out of the shadows. Adoption by gay couples. Gay marriage legalized in almost every country in the world. Thailand just uh, celebrated that gay marriage has been um, uh, passed there. 
Now, should we be mistreating those who are gay and transgender? No. No, we should not be. We should, we should not mistreat them or treat them badly. But we have to understand that it is against God what they're practicing. All these gradual changes since the 1960s have brought us here to the third phase of God's judgment in, on the United States. In Romans 1.28 it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Today, people don't want to hear about no God. They don't want to hear it. You bring it up, oh, you don't talk about politics or God. Those are two subjects you don't talk about. Not at barbecues, not with family, not with anything. You don't, you don't bring those things up. They push them right out, they want to push them right out of people's minds. Even those who claim to believe only want to be bothered on Sundays. Listen to the Quick, listen to a quick sermon and then back to the football game. Okay? We concentrate, we concentrate more on earthly matters and those things that don't glorify God. God isn't trying to interrupt you with your, with your love for unrighteousness and He has turned you over. Alright, so... And what has this turning over to a reprobate mind gotten us? In Romans 1, 29-31, it describes where our society is after the third phase of judgment. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetedness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignant, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in doing them to that, doing them that do them. So, if you look at that list, that's where our society is now. Those are, are the norm. And that comes from us going through the three different phases of judgment, God turning us over to our unrighteousness, and us pushing God out of our minds. And, and we should be worshiping God daily. We should be taking in His Word daily. You know, you eat food every day. If you don't, if you don't eat, like, for a whole day... Your stomach is growling, it's hurting, you're yearning for food, right? That's how it should be when you're not taking in God daily. Your spirit should be yearning and, and starving for His Word and His ways. Amen. All right? If you look on the back of your, of your program, we have the Gospel. And what is the Gospel? Jade, what is the Gospel? Xavier, you know what the gospel is? Junior, you know what the gospel is? Tony, what's the gospel? Tony, I know you know. You hear it every week. <laughs> what is the gospel? The good news. What is the good news? What's the gospel, Chris? Alrighty, so God, the gospel is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. The gospel says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So what does the gospel do? The gospel saves you. The gospel brings you from unrighteousness to the righteousness of Christ. Not our own righteousness, because we can't, we can't have our own righteousness, because we can't be perfect. So by believing in Jesus Christ, we share in His righteousness. And it says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And what that means is if you believe something else, that you've believed it in vain, and, and it's no value to you. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, 
and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the Gospel is believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what you must do to be saved. Believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. So if anybody asks you, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the, what is the gospel? You've got to give them the combination. You know, like you have a lock on your locker. Yeah. You guys have lockers in school? Yeah. Yeah. If, you put the long, if you put the wrong combination in, will that locker open? No. no you, you have to put the right combination in, right? The combination for salvation is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And if you say, if you go in there and you say, well, I'm making a commitment to Christ. That locker won't open. If you go in and say, well, I'm going to repent and I'm going to be baptized. That locker won't open. You have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Then that locker opens. That's the only way to be saved. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, Mike, you want to close up for us? Father, we thank you today for the word of God, rightly divided. And we thank you for the young people that are here, especially, Father God. We pray that they understand what it means to be saved. What it means to be able to go to heaven in the future by trusting in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. Help them to understand, Father, that it's simply believing that Jesus died for them and went to the cross, that he was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Help them to understand this. Help them to believe. Help them to be saved. Father, we need you. We can't do this on our own. This we pray now, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.